And when that, you know, when those crops are ready, they are harvested also by, you know, heavy machinery. Uh, lots of people involved um, in in the process are then once the food is harvested, it's transported generally to a food processing plant where it's uh, trimmed, washed, uh, processed in, in some shape or form, depending on where the food you know is going to go. Um, also, um, af you know, after the food is being processed, it's generally packaged in some sort of package, which basically achieves two objectives. One generally is to keep no, keep the the food um, so it doesn't go go bad, as well as Selling, selling as the products right through the packaging uh, for consumers. After it's packaged, it's then sold to a wholesale distributor. Sometimes it's then resold and resold and resold to other uh, food, uh, you know, wholesale distributors. Finally, it reaches our local supermarket, where we as consumers would you know go and buy it, cook it, and eventually dispose of it. Although most of the stuff that we would be disposing would be recyclable, whether it's the packaging or the actual food waste, the vast majority of it um, ends in the landfill. And so as you can see, this is a linear process. Um, there's a lot of steps involved. There's a lot of people involved. In every single step, uh, we also have transportation. And so the, the CO2 emissions and the greenhouse gas emissions along the way are pretty huge. Um, and you can probably see already where I'm going with this, which is that our food system has a huge, huge impact on our environment. So we all know that you know climate change is a reality. We're already suffering the effects of uh, extreme weather conditions, droughts, floods, uh, you, you name it, right? Um, but when we think about you know threats to our environment, we tend to picture cars and we tend to picture factories and you know the energy industry and, and whatnot, uh, but not the not the plate that we put on our tables. Uh, but it turns out that agriculture is one of the largest contributors uh, to to climate change. Um, so you know three simple statistics that summarize for me this very clearly: agriculture uses seventy percent of the water resources that we have. And it's the largest polluter of water as well. Um, it uses 34% of our total land uh, in, in the planet. Basically, it uses all the land that's available. The rest is either like desert or like the Antarctica or it's somehow protected. So every piece of land that we have that's fertile, that's, that's you know, farmable, it's, it's used for, for, for food production. And it contributes to, you know, some estimates, it, up to a third of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, to the atmosphere. Um, so it has a huge, tremendous impact uh, on our environment. <coughs> Apart from the environment, like what else, you know, what else is wrong with our food system? Um, so if you look at the food industry, we basically have two things. We have seven billion consumers, so a, a huge market, right? Everyone needs to eat. Um, and on one side, right? And then on the other side, we have, say, 1.5 billion producers that produce the food that we eat. But in the middle, we have a very few hands, essentially, controlling how this food is grown, processed, distributed, and sold to consumers. So that's where the, where, that's where the main trouble is, right? We have a, a set of large you know, corporations that control and have a tremendous impact on the standards of our food system, on the prices, on the costs, on the uh, impacts that the food system generates. And generally speaking, um, this influence that they have means that they can extract most of the value of this multi-million, uh, multi-billion industry and pass on the risks and the costs down, down to the bottom of the chain. On this, on this end of the chain. Um, what else? What else is wrong with our food system? Um, well, we are what we eat, right? At the end of the day, we are what we eat. Um, and it turns out that our system is not only broken, it's not only unsustainable, but it's also making us sick. Um, with the increasing predominance of like a lot of processed, we're eating more and more processed foods and drinks. 
Um, and we're also relying on um, sort of a lot of, we're increasing the amount of meat that we're eating um, and um, meat that's full with antibiotics, with all kinds of um, stuff on, on the meat that is basically making us sick. And we can trace, there's a lot of research that sort of shows the connection between the eat that we're currently eating right now and all kinds of health issues like obesity, uh, diabetes, heart disease, um, cancer, cholesterol, etc., etc., etc. And not even that, but even when we're trying to do the right thing, right? Even when we go to the supermarkets and we're like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat fresh vegetables and, and fruits. Um, it turns out that we're also eating a lot of stuff with pesticides. Even when we're trying to avoid like unhealthy processed foods and unhealthy food that we know are not healthy for ourselves, even when we you know try to do the right thing, we're um, we're actually ingest, you know ingesting a lot of pesticides, chemicals in our food. Um, this is you might be familiar with this list. It's called the dirty the dirty list, uh, and it's sort of uh, produced every year, published every year, and sort of basically sort of lists out what are the dirtiest vegetables and fruits that we get in the supermarket, what are the cleanest ones. Just to give you an idea, like an apple on average, um, you, you would find residues of 13 different types of pesticides in it. So, you know, we used to say that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I mean, I'm not sure that's, that's longer, you know, it's, it's no longer about it. So we're, ha you know, again, the food system is having an impact on our environment, on on our economy and our communities, as well as on our own health. And if this wasn't bad enough, um, think about the future, right? We all know that by 2050, we will be 9 billion people on this earth. 70% of these people will be living in cities like Hong Kong, like us. And to be able to meet this, uh, this demand and to feed all these mouths, we will need to increase our food production by a massive 70%. But we're already using all our planets. We're using everything we've got to produce the food um, that we need today. How are we going to feed 9 billion people in 2050? But how about 2100, 2200, like when we are 10 billion people? How on earth are we going to solve this problem? For me, this is the greatest challenge that you know, mankind has to face. We need to feed ourselves and future generations without killing the planet in the attempt, right? So, in my view, that's what we need to do. We need to fundamentally change the way we grow, we consume, or we even think about food. And that's the commitment that I have to, to urban farming because I, I feel it's a, it's a platform to, to achieve that. And so now that I've kind of scared the shit out of everyone, <laughs> uh, let's let's look at you know some potential solutions. Um, so I think that's where urban farming comes. It's not the solution to everything. This is a huge, huge problem. Um, it's a very complex one. Um, it requires the involvement of absolutely everyone: governments, the private sector, farmers, consumers, uh, the uh, civil society, etc. And it requires a lot of imagination, a lot of work, innovation, technology, um, etc., to come up with a, with a solution, right? And it's going to be a multifaceted solution. There's no silver bullet, unfortunately. But I think that urban farming can be part of the conversation and can be part of the, of the solution. Um, and the reason for that is that um, I believe urban farming can bring a lot of benefits to, to a city. Um, from an environmental perspective, the fact that we are growing food, right, exactly where it is consumed, it means that we can lower the food miles and the impacts that our food has in this process that we described at the beginning, right? So instead of having the very complex linear um, system, we can have something like this. So we're growing using organic methods, so we're not using any sort of you know, chemical inputs. Um, we are harvesting when the food is ripe, which is another thing that um, we don't usually get. So in conventional agriculture, generally speaking, um, food is, for example, tomatoes, they are harvested not when they are ripe. 
they harvest it well before so that they can sustain, they can live through that process of getting to our dinner table, which might be thousands of miles away, and it's artificially sort of ripened along the way. That's why, basically, that's why we, you, you'll never taste, you'll never find a tomato in a supermarket that tastes like a tomato, right? Anyone can have ever tried a tomato in a supermarket that was like, wow, what a tomato. <laughs> no? I'll tell you, the other day I ordered some, some vegetables from the local farmers, and I got this box of cherry tomatoes. Put one in my mouth, bite, it's just an explosion of flavor. And that's because they can choose the varieties that they grow, because they know they don't have to travel a million miles to get to the consumer, and they can choose the, the, the varieties for the flavor, for the nutritional value, and pick them when they're absolutely at the right time, which is not something that, that happens with the industrial kind of globalized food system that we've had. Um, so it has also benefits of like taste, which is quite important. Um, once the food is harvested in this kind of new system, um, there will be some packaging, but minimal packaging, minimal transportation, so minimal refrigeration, minimal sort of steps along the way that would also create an impact on the environment, um, sold to the supermarkets or local grocery stores or directly to the consumers. Um, and hopefully, you know, um, we could make we could make use of that food waste that we generate at the end of the of the chain, put it back into no, compost it and put it back into the system. So we're actually creating a, a circular uh, system as compared to the previous one. So that's what we're trying to, you know, aim for. Um, but as well, there's other, you know, other bene uh, benefits. Um, the fact that we are growing stuff, um, we're transforming, basically, we're transforming underutilized concrete spaces in the city and we're turning them into green and productive spaces. So that can also help with the overall sort of um, environment in our city. It's also a good platform to basically just raise awareness on environmental related issues and get more people engaged, get more people involved, and get more people to, to take action on this, on this front. Um, from a health perspective, as I said, when we are, when we are uh, harvesting the food that is ripe and that is fresh, we're, we're eating food at its nutritional maximum. Yeah, generally, when we get the food in the supermarket, the, the nutritional value is already going down. But here, we harvest it and we eat it straight away so we get the freshest food possible. And it's also a platform to not to talk about um, healthy eating and nutrition and you know, engage the engage the public on these topics. Um, from an economic perspective, is also uh, it can also be benefits to the local economy. So we, for example, are engaging a lot of local farmers. So we work with local farmers to get some of our supplies, to get some of our seedlings. Um, we connect them with our, uh, with our clients so they can actually have other channels to sell their vegetables. Uh, we engage them to um, give some trainings uh, or be instructors for some of our workshops. Um, so we are creating a local, you know, local economy around local food production that can be, can be beneficial for, for Hong Kong. And then from a social perspective, um, we can use this opportunity um, to uh, provide training and provide job opportunities for those most in need in our society. As you know, Hong Kong is a very unequal society, and we have lots of groups of different people that don't have the same access to you know, job opportunities. So we, for example, have been training um, people with hearing, hearing impairs um, to become the urban farmers of, of tomorrow and to employ them in our operation. One of them is actually helping with the, with the maintenance here. So I think you know the, the benefits kind of speak for themselves uh, for any city. Um, but what makes it particularly exciting about Hong Kong is that we live in this <coughs> crazy concrete Blade Runner type kind of city, right? Where we're importing over 90% of the foods, mostly from China, especially fresh with fruits and vegetables. Over 90% of them come from China, and we all sort of we all know the, the concerns uh, related to the quality and the safety of some of that produce. It turns out that we have six million square meters of rooftop space in Hong Kong that could be transformed into rooftop farms. And that actually equals the same amount of space that is currently being farmed in Hong Kong in the new territories, farmland. So we actually, just with the rooftop space, we can double the space that's 
you know, use for agriculture. Um, and this is not me saying, this is a, a professor from the from HTU who's been doing a lot of research on on this topic and he's been, you know, uh, going through a lot of assumptions to kind of come up with that number. Um, there is also a, an increasing demand for, for healthy and sustainable foods. And we, I see these every day. Uh, we, uh, I, I think I saw some of you at the Conscious Festival. Uh, there's farmer's market popping up everywhere. There's more vegetarian restaurants and more vegan restaurants. There's more restaurants that are you know, pushing for local and sustainable foods. Uh, there's a general interest and there's a general demand for that kind of food. So I, I believe there's an opportunity for urban farming to kind of fill that gap and also bring all of those other benefits to the city. Again, you know, Hong Kong is, is highly unequal, so we have an opportunity to provide job opportunities to, to the most underprivileged members of our community. And we have a huge, huge problem with food waste. And I'm sure you all know, uh, so I don't, don't probably need to go into much detail on that, but Feeding Hong Kong, which is one of the local food banks, estimates that, <clears throat> that we're wasting 3,200 tons of food waste per day, which is the same as saying, 220 double bus, double decker bus. Let's picture that again. 220 double decker bus full of food waste driving themselves into the landfill every day. So that's, uh, that's a huge problem um, for many reasons. Um, but we can actually, apart from obviously reducing the, the, the waste in the first time, we could actually um, recycle some of that. And, and compost some of that. There's already some restaurants, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's some restaurants here in Central that have created this food waste alliance because they know that the, the, the government is not doing anything, there's no scheme for food waste, and they've taken you know, their things in, in their own hands and they've created sort of their joint forces so that they can all collect their food waste and send it to local farmers so that they can compost it, etc. But there's you know, much more to be done. And so that's where, you know, once, once we kind of understood all of that, um, we decided to, with my co-founders, um, Michelle and Andrew on, on the left, um, we decided to start Rooftop Republic. And that was three years ago. We've been doing our farming for five, six, six, five to six years uh, with a different uh, company before, but then three years ago we started Rooftop Republic. And our aim is to really bring all of these benefits uh, and integrate them into our city. We want this to be commonplace and to be uh, accessible to city people like, like you and me. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of organic farms in the new territories. Um, there's been a growing movement uh, there, and now we have around 450 organic farms, different sizes, you know, some are you know, not for production, more recreational stuff. Uh, but it's, it's, been, you know, it's been growing, but a lot of city people don't have the time uh, to, to go to Shengshu, right, every day, or even every week, or every month. So we want to really bring this back to the heart of the city and integrate it into our, you know, into our day-to-day -day lives and create spaces like, like the one outside. And so <clears throat> in the last three years, we've transformed over 40,000 square feet of completely underused space in around 40 urban farms of different sizes. Some are, you know, some are small, some are large. Um, we've organized over 400 events um, organic farming and sustainable living, engaged you know, thousands of people. Um, we've also donated uh, over 1,500 lunch boxes um, to Feeding Hong Kong. One of our projects in particular uh, at the Bank of America Tower here at Admiralty. All the food that we've been growing there for the last four years has been donated to Feeding Hong Kong. And as I was mentioning, we've trained a group of first cohorts of hearing impaired to become urban farmers and we're starting to employ them in our operations and also trying to connect them with our local uh, organic farmers kind of network so they can get access to, train, uh, to uh, training positions or to uh, internships or to job opportunities. Um, I also wanted to just show you like a few, you know, few snapshots of some of the projects that we've done just to give you an idea. Um, so here, this is a project we have at the Bank of East Asia in Kuntong, where we basically, um, we have been sort of setting up, we sort of set up this farm as part of their sustainability and corporate social responsibility initiatives, and also as part of their employee engagement. So we have a group of super committed, super yeah, devoted people, uh, staff from the bank, 
who are attending this farm on a, on a day to day basis, and we're helping them also to manage uh, the, the farm and, so, and grow their, you know, uh, develop their understanding and their skills on, on how to grow uh, you know, their own food and, and tend for the farm. Spectacular view. That's a good thing about you know, working on rooftops, you get the best views. Uh, this is another project we've been doing um, for, for two or three years with Cathay Pacific. Um, also really successful, we have a group of super committed people, 40 to 50 people, um, that join this sort of seasonal membership uh, scheme to be part of this club, and they also, which we're going to be doing actually here, similar, kind of similar concept with the members of, of our society, um, to, to, to enjoy the activities on the farm and to you know, participate in the, you know, sometimes when we, when we have a good harvest, we bring all the employees together, we bring all the families, and then some of the employees show up their cooking skills and they, they, you know, they cook, they do a cooking <coughs> demonstration with their food uh, to, their, to their, you know, their colleagues. And it's also a good way of like, promoting you know, a sense of belonging to the company and, and uh, connection between the different departments and so on. This one is the project that we have here at uh, the Bank of America, the one that I mentioned that we've been uh, donating all of the foods uh, to feeding on farms. So here, we've been selecting varieties of crops that are you know, more suitable for the local uh, beneficiaries that we, that we will be serving. So not so much you know, basil and uh, kale, but more like bok choy and tursa. Um, but this, this has been a very sort of a very <clears throat> iconic project for us just because it's literally in the middle of the financial district. You have the view of the harbor, the banks of China, you know, it's, you see, like, everything around, and there we are. This actually former helipads, uh, de decommissioned helipads, growing you know growing vegetables. So it's pretty it's pretty stunning. This is another project we've done at the uh, in Taiku um, uh, for Swire, and they have this. Uh, this space here that they call the sustainability corner, where they have a huge composter where they're um, composting food waste from the restaurants in the, in the shopping mall. And they have a lot, of, <clears throat> a lot of recycling facilities over there and sort of panels of information about the uh, Swire's commitment to sustainability. And we've set up a green wall and a, and a, and a herb garden, and we're engaging not only the staff from Swire, but also uh, members of like tenants of these buildings. To participate, in, you know, in regular, uh, in regular activities in the farm. This is uh, our latest project. This is huge. It's like thirteen thousand square feet. Uh, it's in a shopping mall <coughs> in Quai Phong. It's called Metro Plaza, and um, this uh, this is basically aimed at engaging the you know the visitors to the mall and the local population. We're also bringing schools and all kinds of community. Uh, in groups to to the farm to conduct you know all kinds of activities related to, to organic farming, um, and then some of the food here is also we have a program <coughs> with Green Monday and with uh, with the restaurants. So we are actually supplying the restaurants with some of this produce um, uh, in the in the shopping mall. This is a different kind of project we've done um, in Changsha in China, where. Uh, it's more of a residential project. So this is part of their clubhouse. So the same way you know, residents would have access to I don't know, the gym or the pool, we have a, a rooftop farm that we've designed. Um, and we've integrated like, with the whole like, landscape. Here we were able to come in at the design stage. So we were able to you know, set up like a, a workshop area and an open sort of outdoor kitchen and like some landscaping and then some, some farming. And it's part of their <clears throat> part of their concept of the of the residence that they've just uh, built. This is a completely different thing, um, similar to what we have over there. Um, this is in a restaurant in uh, in K11, in, in a shopping mall in in TSD. So it's something wild, <coughs> and their whole concept is around sourcing um, local sustainable food, um, and they use a lot of microgreens. Microgreens are basically this: we germinate the seeds. Uh, for up to seven to ten days, and then they're ready to be harvested. So it's this thing you see on top, generally like a decoration, no? uh, on top of your whatever salad or pasta or meat or whatever it is. Um, and this has been very interesting because this is really integrated with their concept. It's the first thing that you see when you come into the restaurant. Uh, it's all over. The, <clears throat> it's all over their menu. 
Um, and you know, they can, it's, it's a way for them to tell a story also about the food and say, well, this, this pasta with these microgreens literally comes from there, you know, from the, from the entrance of the, uh, of the restaurant. Uh, this is more of a community-focused project. We're working with a um, housing authority to we set up this um, farm at the public housing estates in Taiwan, where we're mostly engaging the local residents, mostly elderly. So it's a way of like creating bonds and um, sort of fostering a sense of community among the, the residents of the, of the public housing estate. And we also do a lot of like. We also bring these to schools for, you know, for education. We take them out to some of the organic farms that we work with. We take them out to some of the rooftop farms that we operate. And we sort of <clears throat> teach uh, students about the story of their book. Uh, yeah, and this is the last one. Uh, it's the, the training program that I mentioned. This is Eva, our superstar. Um, she's incredible. Um, and she's been helping here at the, at the, at the Grand Society with the maintenance as well. So, uh, you know, after this kind of little overview of, uh, of our food system, of, you know, what is wrong, basically our food system sucks and we need to do something about it. And I think urban farming allows us for an opportunity to, to, to act on it. Um, and I wanted to suggest <clears throat> a few ideas so that you can take, you know, take them home and, and see if you'd like to, uh, to explore them. Um, the first one is that when we think about you know, super complex problems and challenges, climate change and global warming and the food system, it's, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's very easy to feel helpless and useless. You're only just one individual, right? But we as consumers have a huge power. And so we at least can vote three times per day with our work. And we can decide which kind of food systems we're supporting. Are we supporting the first food system we looked at or are we supporting a different kind of food system? So here in Hong Kong, <clears throat> you know, Believe it or not, uh, you can actually support a local farmers and get your supplies from local farmers. And a lot of, when I say that, a lot of people ask me, okay, but where do I get it? So I already gave you the answer. <laughs> um, these are some um, online sort of platforms that you can look at um, to, to order deliveries, and it's super convenient. They deliver it to your home. Um, some of them organized, for example, is just local farmers. Um, I believe the other three source their products from local farms, but also from other suppliers elsewhere. Um, but in any case, you know, check them out and, and, and consider uh, supporting the local farmers. You can also go to as farmers markets in Central Pier, there's one <coughs> in Quarry Bay, not all year round, but there's, there's one during the cool seasons of the month, in Meifu, in Taipo, um, if you live in Saipun, there's a guy selling organic vegetables in the wet market. So there, there are alternatives out there, and I would encourage you to kind of um, explore them. And Joe Sun is uh, a member of Grass Society, by the way. A little bit of promotion. Um, the other thing is learn about learn about your foods. I think it's it's important. We're we're city dwellers are completely disconnected, right? We we don't even think it twice. We go to supermarkets. And there's availability of all kinds of foods all year round. We don't even know anymore what the seasons are, right? When is when are strawberries supposed to be in season? Um, or what kind of journey, right? Like that the food is, is making to, to get to our dinner plate. So I think I would encourage you to kind of look at what are the steps that the food goes through to, to, to get to you. And obviously the best thing is to grow your own. It's incredibly satisfying. <clears throat> I have my own rooftop. It's not very it's not very big. It's maybe like 25 square uh, meters. And I've got around like six planters, similar to, to those. Um, and we were talking before about like, are you able to supply yourself? No, I'm not able to supply myself with everything I need. But with the stuff that I'm growing, I don't need to buy that type. So I'm growing, you know, I've been growing now tomatoes, lettuce, kale, beans, all kinds of herbs, uh, among other things. I don't need to go to the and buy those things. If I want big roots and carrots, I need to go to the supermarket. But at least I can source myself with part of my, my food. I can also compost uh, the food waste I'm generating and put it back into my uh, into my planters, into my soil. So it's a good a good way of getting you getting you started. And as I said, re related to that, I think we need to do much much better at, at dealing with our waste uh, and finding ways of recycling it. 
Um, <clears throat> and then, I don't know if you know, but Michael Pollan, he's, a, he's a, an active food activist and professor at the University of Berkeley. It's, it's, uh, it's someone that has been inspiring me a lot. And he's got this book called In Defense of Food. And he starts with a basic question. What should we eat? Um, in terms of looking at the whole picture, no? what is the impact that the food that I'm putting in my, in my belly has on myself, on my health, on my environment, on my community? What should be the answer to that basic, basic question? And his conclusion is fairly simple. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, eat food means eat real food, eat wholesome food, less processed food. Not too much, we've been kind of basically influenced by the industry to eat tons of food and large portions so that we consume more, right? But it turns out we actually don't eat that much food and mostly plants. Um, he basically comes up saying that he actually eats meat, but he measures the amount of meat that he eats and the types of meat that he gets. So I recommend the reading of, uh, of that one. And then last but not least, we need to take a stand. Um, we can do everything we want, but if we don't have our governments involved, we're never going to you know, uh, create real systemic change. So, um, and I think that the government here is, is lagging behind a little bit. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for us to push the government to, to do more. Um, I had a meeting with <coughs> some officials recently, and I was quite encouraged in one way. Um, they said that in their new 2030 strategy for Hong Kong, which is a, is a document that you can all access online, it was the first time that <coughs> urban farming was mentioned. So there's some language there that has been already included in the strategy, which is a very good thing. But they're completely confused internally on who's supposed to take that on. Is it the land department? Is it the <laughs> fisheries and agriculture department? Is it the buildings department? They have no idea. Um, and they said, basically, keep pushing us so that we get our act together. We're much better at reacting than, than at proactively you know, promoting something new. So keep, keep, keep taking a stand and keep pushing us to, to do better, and we'll deliver. So I you know, count on all of you to join the movement and, and take a stand as well. I hope that was somehow insightful, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> what I love about the Q and A's is that everyone has a specific question about their their own like growing problems and concerns. Um, so yeah, so typhoons are basically a challenge in Hong Kong and the farmers in general as well. Um, we basically secure all the planters um, to make sure that uh, they're like safe and harvest as much as we can. Um, but there's not much else you can do. Um, the, the plants will be, you know, battered. Uh, but you'll be also surprised how, you know, how resilient they are and how they can come back uh, into life. Um, but the, the main priority is like safety. Just make sure that you know, there's no loose ends and that everything is secure. We sometimes attach the, you know, the planters together, attach the planters to the railing so that there's no there's no problem there, and 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 try to harvest as much as we can. Yeah. Um, the stat says uh, one third of the agriculture grown food goes to waste, and eighty percent of it goes to waste actually before the food even reaches the retail store. So like almost half of the food just never sees the retail store. And I was curious about like how much how much better is urban farming versus traditional farming at managing or at like, reducing food waste? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so the food waste, um, it varies greatly in terms of the reasons why we have food waste in developing countries or in developed countries. In developing countries, the challenges are more on the production side, the transportation, the storage, you know, the cooling, the getting it to the market. All of those is very, you know, all of those steps can be challenging in developing countries. And there's a lot of food waste that happens even, you know, at the farm or at, before it even reaches the, the supermarket. In the developed countries, it's less so the case. It's more afterwards um, when it's at the supermarket. Like now, 
we, we don't eat ugly vegetables, right? You see an ugly vegetable as a consumer? No way. If it's not a perfectly round, you know, red tomato that sort of clicks with your imagined idea of the ideal tomato, we don't, we don't go for it. So anything that's ugly, out of the way already. Um, and then there's a lot of waste. Um, so for you know everything that's kind of reaching its end, it's already kind of cleared from supermarkets. And then on our side, as consumers, we also you know have, you know, have a lot of waste. Uh, I think. Um, in our households, that, so there's a huge proportion. I don't know what the percentage would be, but there's a huge proportion on the household. Um, so I think that in terms of urban farming, um, I think that the fact that we have this kind of proximity with where the food is produced and the journey it needs to make to the consumers is so short and so direct, that already eliminates you know some of the problems. Um, like when I when you order from some of those platforms or from the local farmers. Um, they harvest it you know, early in the morning and you get it in the afternoon. And that's going to be the freshest you can get. So that will also stay longer uh, in, your, you know, in your fridge. And then it's up to us, you know, educated consumers, to make sure that we're ordering, like we're buying the quantities that we need and not too much and that we're you know, making use of that, of that uh, food. So I do think there's a there's a positive, you know, impact in that sense. Does um, does farming in an urban environment affect the quality of the food? Um, say, air quality in Hong Kong is bad on a good day and really bad on a bad day. <laughs> does that affect the vegetables you grow, like right here on the main road? Yeah. Yeah, that's a question we get a lot. Uh, obviously, you know, people in Hong Kong are very concerned about air pollution. Um, we've done quite a little bit of research on this. Um, it doesn't seem to have a, a, a major effect. Uh, most of the pollutants in the air actually stay on the surface uh, of, the, of the plant. So with a simple rinse, you can actually get rid of 99% of that, which you should do anyways with any vegetable that you buy. Um, and to be honest, I think it's a bit of a trade-off um, because we don't, like, I would encourage you also to think the same way, critically the same way, when you go to the supermarket. Um, because I'd rather, to be honest, I'd rather, tr I, I'd rather eat my vegetables from my rooftop than the choice sum that I see on the wet market. Um, some of our farmers uh, always say, don't eat choice for example, right? Choice sum, don't eat choice sum. The king vegetable of Cantonese cuisine, is, turns out it's super prone to pests, and it's sprayed, you know, two or three times per week every, you know, uh, every week. Um, so I'd rather, you know, deal with the air pollution and try to minimize that, um, as opposed to getting the, you know, the vegetables that we get, which are, you know, full of chemicals as well. Aren't a lot of the vegetables imported from China actually? So the yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the the vegetables that you're you're getting are from from China, so. The situation is not any better there. Uh, so yeah, it's a bit of a trade-off in that sense. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, Paul, for your presentation. Uh, another question I have is, when you started the Rooftop Republic, what was your commitment, and how do you stick to your commitment for this vision? Good question. <laughs> So as I said, like when I started um, getting into urban farming, I knew nothing about it, but and I knew nothing about agriculture and growing your own food and, and so on. But the more I learned, um, the more commitment so I developed, and it became from something that I didn't know about to being a, like an obsession. Like this is this is huge. We need to like. It was. It became my passion in a way, um, and I, I saw the huge potential to have a positive, you know, positive impact, um, and especially in a place like Hong Kong. It just everything sort of clicked, and as as we started, it was kind of a hobby. I had a different job, you know, whatever. It was. We started a project. It was kind of like you know, amateurish at the beginning with the previous with the previous organization I was involved. But then, as, as I said, like the commitment, the, the obsession, the, the knowledge, and the, uh, the, the, the 
this potential that I was seeing sort of started to grow, um, and and I decided, okay, this is this is it. Right? I'm, I'm gonna devote myself fully, fully to this. And also my co-founders, we're all full time. We have five staff, so we're really, um, yeah, really, really devoted to it. Um, and that sort of commitment and, and that sort of vision for um, for the work that we're trying to do is also what you know keeps me keeps me going uh, every day and. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been, it's been a very rewarding journey. It's full of obstacles, full of challenges, full of, as anyone would know here in the startup world, you know, running your own company is, is by no means easy. Um, and when we started, it wasn't, there, there isn't even an industry for this. Like, we are actually helping to create a new industry. So uh, we didn't know whether this was going to work, to be honest. This is going to, this is going to fly. Are people going to buy this? Who's going to be our clients? And, you know, we didn't know. We had no idea. No business plan. No, you know, let's go. Um, but you know, the journey has been a, a very exciting one. And surprisingly enough, we've actually received a lot of like, positive, you know, positive response from Hong Kong. So that keeps us going as well. <laughs> Great. So I think we have one last question here. Thanks for a really inspiring but also informative talk. Uh, my question is just really simple, I guess, how do organizations get involved? So for example, Bank of America, do they reach out to you? Are they trying to fulfill some kind of policy? Or are you kind of you know, lobbying these kind of organizations to really get involved in something that's much more green? Yeah, sure. So we actually work with a, a different kind of range of, uh, of clients. So we work a lot with property developers um, and property management firms. Uh, because they're in the business of like building and managing buildings, so we have all, all of these properties. Um, and generally, we work with them either like the one in Changsha to actually be part of their design sort of concept, or uh, <clears throat> we work with their sustainability and CSR departments as a way of like um, promoting you know sustainability um, and also employee engagement. And that's the same for like other corporate clients that we have. Um, and that's been one of the main drivers, actually, for, for the clients that we have. We also work with hotels uh, and restaurants for similar reasons, for like sustainability-related reasons and doing engagement, um, but also as a way of supply. In that case, you know, there's a direct use of the food, so we are supplying their kitchens. Um, and uh, it's also a good story to tell, and like, it, it helps with the concept of the restaurants, etc. Uh, we also work with schools, and that would be more for like, the educational side of things. Um, we also help some individuals who have a rooftop space and want to, uh, you know, have their own garden for their own family or for themselves. Um, and we also work with like more community kind of focused uh, projects where we partner up with NGOs or with, like, with government departments um, to to benefit different you know groups of the community. So there's a, like it's a there's a wide range of people that we're engaging with. Um, you can come in in any of this sort of areas uh, as long as you know basically as long as they have a space and have an interest in turning it into a you know into an urban farm we, we can help them. Is it that you're approaching them though or are they actively approaching you and saying hey we want to get involved? To be honest we're really lucky and most of the clients we have they've been approaching us. Um, also there's not I guess there's not a lot of competition out there so when you know inside urban farming Hong Kong we probably come up you know up there and, and it's kind of easier for them to find us. Um, but yeah, we obviously also, you know, do all kinds of things to acquire new customers, like any other startup. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you, guys. Thanks.